there to you on Instagram and hello there to you on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube. Um, it is great to have your company right now. Um, we are going into another one of our one hour CLE continuing legal education sessions. And what we're going to be discussing today is the topic of derivative actions. And that might sound super boring uh, and all that kind of stuff. Mish, great to have your company. Karen, great to see you. Well, Cullen, great to see you. Man, appreciate you joining. Very kind. Um, great to have your company. We're going to spend the next hour or so talking about derivative actions. And what you may well say is that's super boring. And part of my job is to change your mind about that. Uh, so hopefully through today's discussion, we're going to work through what can be a little bit of a fiddly area of the law. And by the time we get to the end, Anna, thanks for joining. Thanks to you all for joining. Um, hopefully by the end of the discussion today, we are going to get to a bit of a better understanding of the nature of the derivative action. Now I'm going to start talking densely and, you know, get into the fine details shortly. Um, and uh, that is what we're going to get on to. Anna, great to see you. Thanks for joining the session. Really appreciate it. Um, and what uh, we're going to do is we're going to divide today's discussion into three sections. And these are three sections that we actually divided last week's discussion in and that we'll be dividing the next few weeks discussion in. But I'll get to that bit of admin shortly. Today, we're going to talk about the law of derivative, derivative actions. We're going to have a crunchy chat about how the actual nuts and bolts of the legislation on one hand and the inherent jurisdiction of the court on the other hand, work in relation to derivative actions. And after a book falls down and uh, we uh, finish that discussion about the law, uh, we are then going to spend a considerable amount of time working through some examples. So section one, law, we'll get into that technical crunchy stuff. Section two, we're gonna work through uh, some litigated examples of what happens with derivative actions uh, when they're actually on the ground running around. And the third section, to the extent we've got time, uh, we, I'm going to get into some uh, suggestions. Now, um, what uh, I am going to do, Avon, thanks for joining us. Uh, James, very kind as always. Uh, what I'm going to do through this session is I'm going to be glancing over your shoulder over here to a PDF document I've got that's got my notes there. So. Um, I'm not touchy about it. If you're interested in the notes or if you have to leave early or anything like that, um, please feel free just to ping me a message, a DM um, or an email. Please don't comment in the thing because I'm not going to go back through those comments because I'm lazy. Um, but do please feel free to message me if you would like a copy of the notes I'm working from. What's the final bit of admin? Ah, the final bit of admin, Luke, great to see you. Final bit of admin is that I'll put a comment here that some of you will be able to see about the upcoming uh, sessions we've got coming up. So I'm doing five of them. Five, can you both see that? Five, five. First one was corporate oppression. That's over, that happened. You can find a record of that last talk up on my YouTube channel or on my Instagram page, and I'll get it to my podcast soon. Today, we are doing derivative actions. Next week, what are we doing? We're doing statutory trustees for sale which we in New South Wales sometimes call Section 66G trustees. Then we're going to do partnership disputes. Then we're going to do just an equitable winding up. So basically, I'm going through a series of one hour CLEs um, where I'm doing my best to try to share um, some of the, I won't call them insights, but some of the things that I've learned, some of the things I've bumped into um, in relation to some of these areas. So it's great to have your company. Um, I will look forward to joining you, hopefully, um, in relation to uh, one of these sessions that I think I've managed to throw on the screen just here. Uh, perhaps yes, perhaps no, uh, but I'd love to see you. Uh, look, love you to stay in this session, it goes without saying, but love to have you in those future sessions as well. Um, Daniel has the right approach that a 66G application is great fun. We'll get into one of those in future. But today we are talking about the derivative action and the derivative action is um, something um, that allows a shareholder and sometimes uh, some other parties as well to make an application to stand in the shoes of a company and to run a piece of litigation on that company's behalf. 
Now, the reason this is an area of law that I like to talk about and the reason it's an area of law that can sometimes get a bit tricky is because sometimes the distinction between who is a shareholder in the company, so I might own all the shares in James PTY Limited, so what are the assets or what are the choses in action that belong to me personally, James? And what are the choses in action and other assets that belong to James PTY Limited? Right? There's a difference between a shareholder, someone who owns the shares in a company, and the company itself. And sometimes things can get fuzzy. If you have a person called James who owns the shares in James PTY Limited, which might be the trustee for the James Trust, and we might sort of find ourselves getting in knots. Um, just before we get into the real technicality of the talk, I thought I'd suggest to you a way of thinking about these things that assists me is you take the example of BHP, which is a very large uh, mining company in Australia. And it's sort of one of your classic uh, dig stuff out of the ground and sell it um, type businesses that have been around in Australia for a long time. And um, you sort of hold it out as an example of we might all be shareholders in BHP. We might own a share or two or three. And so we might own some of it, but we're not directors of BHP. We're not there sitting at the board making decisions about its strategy and the next steps it's going to engage in. Similarly, if someone does wrong by BHP, it's not for us as shareholders to sue that person. It is for BHP to sue that person. And that is the challenge really at the centre of today's discussion. When is a claim not a claim of the shareholder but a claim of the company? And what can a shareholder do if the company has a claim and the company is not pursuing it? Now, that might sound a little bit technical, so let me just give you the most common example of when the discussion about derivative actions tends to come up and get a bit exciting and get a bit crunchy. And that is when a director or directors owe duties to a company and the directors allegedly breach those duties and they prevent the company from suing themselves, right? So let's say you and I are shareholders in Us PTY Limited and I am the sole director of Us PTY Limited and I steal all of Us PTY Limited's money. Well, you might be pretty grumpy about that, but you're not a director of Us PTY Limited. So you can't really make it come and sue me, come and pursue me for that money I've stolen. Uh, and so you're sort of left there sitting on your hands because you don't have a claim. You don't have anything you can come before the court to agitate about. Well, that's where the derivative action comes in. You can come to the court to apply for leave, to stand in the shoes of the company, to stand in the shoes of us, PTY Limited, which is an unfortunate name uh, to have chosen now that I've used it a number of times, but. You can come to the court to make that application. And if you're successful, the court will then go and grant you leave to stand in the shoes of the company to pursue me for taking the money. We're gonna work through a lot of examples, so it's gonna make sense. But in essence, what we're dealing with today is what do you do if you own shares in a company and the company's not suing someone, probably a misbehaving director, who you think the company should be suing. And it's solving that problem today that's going to be at the heart of the discussion. Now, um, the section of the Corporations Act is going to be extracted in the paper. So feel free to DM me um, for a copy of the paper. I'd be very happy to email it to you and all that sort of thing. Um, section 236 is the section that actually does the work, but it only does the work if the Section 237 criteria are met. And I should just say at the moment that um, the work to be done, the leave being sought, um, is in respect of a company that is solvent uh, and not in liquidation. Um, if a company is in liquidation, then um, it is the inherent jurisdiction of the court that allows a contributory or a former shareholder to seek leave in respect of it. If that sounds clear as mud, we're gonna to get to an example and it's okay, we'll work through it together, I promise. But broadly speaking, what we're doing is you and I are shareholders. There is some claim that the company has that the company is not bringing. And you and I want to stand in the shoes of the company to try to pursue uh, whoever it is we say has done wrong by the company. And as I say, it's always, almost always a misbehaving director 
who we want to come and chase. And so that question is just to frame it up for all these lovely new people who are coming in on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, um, welcome. Uh, that's what we're talking about today. If you're the shareholder in a company, the company has a claim, but it's not pursuing it. What can you do as a shareholder to make the company chase that person? As I mentioned before, you can meet the section 237 subsection two criteria. And what we're gonna do at the moment, it's gonna sound a bit boring and it's gonna be a bit boring, um, is we are going to work through how that section works. And as I say, all this stuff is extracted in the paper if you'd like a copy of it. But section 237, subsection two, is divided into five little subsections. And if you're able to tick, 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 tick all five of those subsections, the court must grant you leave as a shareholder. So what are those sections that you and I as shareholders in us PTY Limited need to tick in order for us to be granted leave to stand in the shoes of us PTY Limited and bring this application? Well, let's have a think about it. <clears throat> the first element of our application, the first thing we have to prove pursuant to subsection 237 sub 2A is we have to show firstly that the company is not going to bring the claim itself. So that might seem a bit obvious, but we do have to prove it. We do have to be able to say, hey, look, here's evidence that the company is not going to sue this person. So we can satisfy that box, or if we can satisfy that box, we've ticked our first box and we can move on to the next section. The next thing we have to prove, if we are shareholders and we are seeking leave to stand in the shoes of the company to bring a derivative application is we need to prove we are coming in good faith. And we're gonna get into some of the fiddly, knotty bits of good faith through today's discussion. But good faith doesn't necessarily mean holding hands, dancing around the maypole and sending each other daisy chains and becoming pen pals and all that stuff. It doesn't have to be being best friends with everyone. It just means that the application must not be for an ulterior purpose or for any abusive process or motivated by some improper basis. You're allowed to be angry with the person and often you know, you're gonna be angry with a director who you think stolen money from your company. Um, you're allowed to have some grudges, you're allowed to have you know, personal grumpiness, but if the application is nearly motivated by that personal animus, then there's a good chance it's not being brought in good faith. But if you're just a shareholder who sees money taken away from your company and if you get that money back, the value of your shares are gonna increase, then it's likely you're gonna meet that good faith test. Now, section 237, subsection two, little lowercase c, uh, the one that turns into a copyright uh, slide every time you try to write it, um, it deals with, is it in the best interests of the company that the specific person applying for leave be granted leave? This is a really fiddly question, right? So if you and I are disappointed shareholders, and we think that our director has run off with all the money that should, should have been in the bank account for us PTY Limited. We have to prove not only that it's in the best interest of the company that someone goes and sues the misbehaving director. Oh, Spooko's joined the chat. I'm a big fan of Spooko. Um, we not only have to prove that someone uh, has, sorry, that it would be in the best interest of the company that someone joined the chat, we have to prove that it would be in the best interest of the company that you and I specifically ought to be granted leave to pursue this person on behalf of the company. So there's two elements of that, if I can just really sort of tease it out. We have to say it's in the best interest of the company that the claim be brought at all. Secondly, we have to show that it's gonna be in the best interest of the company that specifically you and I or wh whoever it is making the application specifically that it is in the best interest of the company that, that the applicants, the people who are applying, are granted leave. Section 237, subsection two, lowercase d, is about a serious question to be tried. And that is more or less the identical test that you and I would think of when we think about an interlocutory injunction. You need to be able to show the court, not necessarily that it's an absolute proven, 100% guaranteed claim, but, you do have to show the court that, look, there's enough evidence here, there's enough of a serious question to be tried that uh, taking a look at this, um, the parties, I'll draw that, but taking a look at this, the test is met for leave to be granted to stand in the shoes of the company for us to bring this claim. So as you can imagine, 
um, subsection little c and subsection little d often interact a bit because it's not going to be in the best interest of the company to bring a shit claim <laughs> respectfully and similarly um, it's not necessarily going to be a great claim if it's being brought by me and for whatever reason I'm not a particularly good person to run a piece of litigation. So that best interest serious question point you often see interact a little bit when you're working through to the law related to derivative actions. And then E, section 237 sub 2 little e, that's a notice uh, question and it's rarely a matter of contest. Either you gave notice that you were going to bring this application or you didn't give notice. And if you didn't give notice, the court is able to cure that problem reasonably quickly. And so um, while I don't want to be dismissive um, improperly, I would say um, that uh, it is so often uncontroversial that I won't spend a lot of time on it now. Now, that's sort of a natural pause for me to just do a quick bit of admin. We're gonna, I'm gonna try to have you all out by 1.30 today. It's great to have your company. If you have to leave early, this will stay uploaded on LinkedIn, YouTube, uh, Instagram. So it's gonna stay there. And I'll probably, probably get around to uploading the audio to my podcast as well. I'm also reading from a paper. And so if you're interested in the notes that I'm working from, just send me a DM and I'll email them or, or message them over to you. I find that is fine. I'm just getting a couple of questions in. Can I say that all questions are welcome? Ask them at any time. I'm very content with that. Over here, we have a LinkedIn user, and I'm sure you have a name that is more profound than uh, whether or not you use LinkedIn, but that's just what it's saying on my screen. Can a person who has shares held in a bear trust make use of 66G? I think I'm not going to give advice on that on the fly, but I think that there can be an application for statutory trustees to be appointed pursuant to like section 36 conveyance act. Give me a sec. I won't spend long on this, I promise, but I am sure that 66G applies to chattels. Sorry, I'll draw, I'll draw exactly what I just said. I'm sure that an application for the appointment of trustees pursuant to Section 66G can include, I could have sworn it was 36.1 of the Conveyancing Act. Let me just dive into it. I'm so sorry. This is a really good question. I'll just throw it up there on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube again for us all to have a quick look at. I'm not planning to get too distracted, but I could have sworn 36.1 of the Conveyancing Act doesn't exist so you can just ignore me i'm gonna to to get back to you oh, and we will deal with it in the 66g presentation in any case i'm so sorry oh, memories let me down it happens from time to time but there we go but i will have an answer for you and i'd love to give it to you in our presentation on 66g coming in future weeks that reminds me if you want these notes email me um, tell your friends about, uh, you know, some guy giving a presentation. Please feel free to do that and feel free to ask questions. So we are working through the first section of our talk today. We're going to talk law, then we're going to talk litigated examples, then we're going to talk some practical suggestions if we get enough time. So what we just did was we worked through those subsections of section 237. Is the company going to sue? Are the applicants coming in good faith? Is it in the best interest of the company that the applicants be granted leave? Uh, is there a serious question to be tried? And did we fulfill that notice requirement that sort of doesn't matter all that much? Like it matters, but, but you know, <laughs> I don't want to rank them, but, it, but if I was to rank them, it would be the least important section. Don't hold me to that. But uh, look, you get, you get where I'm coming from. It's lovely to have young Ben Gabriel in the house um, and, uh, Look, I'm pretty sure Ben's sitting just outside that door there. So Ben, lovely to see you. Really appreciate you joining the live. Very generous of you. Do you remember earlier in this discussion that I said a company that was solvent and not in liquidation would be a company that could make use of Section 237 and the Corporations Act generally? Well done, if you remember that. The subsequent comment to make is that if there is a company that is in liquidation, and if you are a contributory in respect of that 
of your new shareholder before it was placed into liquidation, then and you wanted to seek leave to bring a derivative action. You wanted to seek leave to stand in the shoes of that company to go and sue someone else. The way for you to do that is for you to seek leave pursuant to the inherent jurisdiction court. We're going to get to, to the criteria that apply to such an application right now. The criteria are different and the ability for the court to grant leave in respect of a company in liquidation, or you can say in lick, if you want to be cool, a company in lick, um, the criteria are different, right? So let's just run this sort of central example we've got again. You and I are shareholders in Us PTY Limited. The, we say the director of Us PTY Limited has stolen a million dollars. Because we are only shareholders and we are not directors, you and I can't cause us PTY Limited to go and sue the misbehaving director. And so we seek leave to bring a derivative suit. We seek leave to stand in the shoes of the company to go and sue this miscreant director who's stolen our company's money, right? If a company is not in liquidation and there's an argument about receivership, we can have another time. But if the company is not in liquidation, then we use the section of the Corporation Act, uh, Corporation Act Section 236 and 237 that I referred to earlier. If the company is, oh, sorry, I'm just excited. It's an exciting area. If the company is in liquidation, then we need to rely on the inherent jurisdiction of the court in order for us to obtain leave to stand in the shoes of the company. Now, this rarely happens. And if you're in the mood to engage on social media, you're welcome to speculate as to why. Um, I know there are some insolvency practitioners scrolling down here and also scrolling down here. So um, a number of you with your thinking caps on will have already realized why. Of course, the reason is if a liquidator is appointed to a company, they themselves are likely to either pursue um, any director who they consider has breached the directors to the company and or a disgruntled shareholder like you and me are probably more likely to put that liquidator in funds in order for them to go and pursue the misbehaving director rather than um, you or I seeking leave to, um, rather than you or I seeking leave to bring a derivative suit on account of that company in liquidation. Hope that makes sense. Again, open to questions, open to comments, but I'm going to keep marching on. We've now spent three minutes longer than I intended uh, on the law, but I think we got there. If I can just refresh where we got to, because this is the hardest bit, like you're, you're 90 seconds, 120 seconds from getting out of the hardest bit of today's discussion. So I just might limit it. I just want to linger on it for a moment, please, if, you, if you'll stay with me. There are two bases that a shareholder or contributory former shareholder for a company in liquidation might be granted leave to stand in the shoes of the company to sue someone else. Often that example is going to be you and me. We are shareholders in us PTY Limited. A director has stolen all the money out of us PTY Limited and that director is preventing us PTY Limited from suing them for running away with us PTY Limited's money. The derivative suit is our way as shareholders to stand in the shoes, and I'm, I'm just using that term because it's useful, it's not a legal term at all, to stand in the shoes of us, PTY Limited, to go ahead and pursue this miscreant director who's stolen the company's money. If the company is solvent, then what happens is we turn to the Corporations Act and we satisfy those five criteria. Is the company gonna do it? Are we coming in good faith? Is it the best interest that we do it? Serious question to be tried and that little notice requirement. If the company is, I'll say insolvent, if the company is in, li in liquidation, then we turn to the inherent jurisdiction of the court and the court has a discretion as to whether to grant leave. Remember section 237, the court must grant leave if there are ticks in each of those boxes. If the company is in lick, the court has a discretion as to whether or not it wishes to grant leave. And in considering that, uh, the court will consider whether the claim has a solid foundation. The court will consider 
the attitude of the liquidator, what the liquidator reckons. And the court will also consider some practical considerations as well. Whew, that was the hardest bit of the talk. I'm about to have a sip of water. Um, I'd love it if you had any questions or any comments you wanted to make so that I can deal with them now-ish, if that's all right. But we're just about to get into a decision called Carpenter and Pioneer Park. Uh, as I think I've said, I'm reading from notes here, and if you'd like a copy, please feel free to message me. I'll pass them on to you. Okay, Carpenter and Pioneer Park. Um, we've got a member of a company, and what that member sought to do was to commence derivative proceedings in relation to Michaela Great to CU, in relation to um, a claim against a lender. And what our applicant today, our applicant member said was, hey, there's this $50 million debt that the lender has sued about. That was actually a farm debt. And the way the Farm Debt Mediation Act works is if you're gonna come and collect a farm debt like you just purported to do, you gotta have a mediation first. You didn't have the mediation. And so uh, your application to appoint receivers and do all this other enforcement flavored stuff fails. Now, what is interesting is not so much that farm debt question. There's evidence that about these four different entities that one of them um, you, you know, engaged farmers and one of them did farming work and sort of owned land and caused olive groves to be grown and this sort of thing. Another of them uh, was the owner of the IP, you know, the trademarks in relation to the labels you put on olive oil and, uh, you know, the uh, processes you use to go through and produce some of the primary materials that were produced on the farm. The interesting thing is not, so I'll draw that. The most interesting thing is not necessarily um, were each of these entities defined as a farm? And in relation to one of them, the answer was yes. And in relation to a couple of the others, I think it's two of the others, the answer was no, meaning that the Farm Debt Mediation Act applied to one and didn't apply to the ones who didn't meet that test. The interesting part for your and my discussion today is how do these things sink in with the criteria we've just very enjoyably learned about um, earlier? Now, get ready for a shocker. Some of these four companies are solvent. And so the application will be pursuant to section 237 of the Corporations Act. And some of them are in liquidation. And so some of the applications are pursuant to the inherent jurisdiction of the court. Now, do you remember the distinction between those two that we spoke about earlier? The application pursuant to the Corporations Act has to comply with those section 237 criteria. Is the company going to do it? Uh, come, are they coming in good faith? Is it in the best interest of the company? Is there a serious question to be tried? Have we complied with this notice period? That sort of doesn't matter. But uh, that's the question for the company that is solvent, right? The question for the company in liquidation, in lick, um, is, is the court going to exercise its discretion having turned its mind to does the claim have a solid foundation? What are some practical considerations and what is the attitude of the liquidator? Now, um, what we have in this case is we've got those two tests running in parallel, right? Because on one hand, we've got the solvent company that uh, has the test operating pursuant to section 237 this way. And then on the other hand, we've got the companies that have been placed into liquidation that have the test being run pursuant to the inherent jurisdiction of the court, right? Running this way. And so the court has to form its view in relation to the company in liquidation as to whether to exercise its discretion. And in relation to section 236 and 237 of the Corporations Act, whether the criteria have been met that mean the court must grant leave. I know it's super fun. Uh, and so um, we find ourselves uh, with the court working through these practical considerations. And I've just got to spoil the ending a bit because I'm conscious of time and I know we've only got another half hour together. But the court's working through these considerations and one of the most fundamental was that the applicant gave an indemnity to the company, right? And that's often what an applicant to bring leave will do. Um, it will say it's in the best interest of the company because I will pay if the company loses the litigation, right? It's not in the best interest of the company if the company is going to be exposed to a cost order. And show, so I'm going to show it is in the best interest of the company because I'll cover the cost order. 
That's what the applicant said here. Now, the challenge for the applicant was that the applicant had an outstanding debt of $62,000 uh, and was the subject of bankruptcy proceedings that had been adjourned. And let me just get the numbers for you. Um, I'll withdraw that. The applicant had assets of $6,200. The uh, applicant owed debts, had credit card debts of $250,000 had made personal guarantees in the quantum of $25 million. Uh, I would draw $25 million, $45 million, and had a judgment against him from the ANZ exceeding $11 million, as well as a debt to the relevant lender in these proceedings um, of $23 million. And so what the court said essentially was, hey, look, thanks for your offer of the indemnity. Um, it's not in the best interest of the company, that Section 237 test for leave to be granted in respect of you giving an indemnity. Oh, sorry, because your indemnity is worth so little, it's not really in the best interest of the company for you to give it. Similarly, in relation to the company's in liquidation, the court did not exercise its discretion to grant leave pursuant to its inherent jurisdiction because it found that the practical consideration of, hey, can this guy pay if the company has a cost order made against it, weighed against leave being granted. So that was the case of Sundara that I improperly described as Carpenter in Pioneer Park. Um, now that's a problem because I also wanna talk about Carpenter in Pioneer Park and about a thousand other cases and we've only got 28 minutes left. Now, I'll just return to the admin that I know I've come to a lot of times. This is the second in a series of five of these talks. I'd love you to come to all five, or if you miss them, they are, they're all gonna get uploaded to YouTube and LinkedIn and that kind of thing. Um, so you're gonna be able to come back and catch up on them if you want. Um, I'm also reading from notes over here. As you can tell, I'm not directly reading from them, but I'm, but I'm referring to them. If you'd like a copy of these notes, they're all right. They're, like, they're pretty handy notes. Um, I'm happy to send them to you if you wanna uh, message me or anything like that, that is fine. Uh, and we're moving, we are in the third, sorry, we're in the second part of today's discussion. Remember the first thing we discussed was the substantive law. We now got into the rude finger bit of the discussion, which is practical examples we're working through. And then if we get, a, if we get time, which I think we will get some time, um, we are going to move into some practical stuff, some suge practical suggestions from me. But now, as I said, I want to talk about Carpenter and Pioneer Park. This case is about a would-be derivative appeal. Um, and before we get to that, Ibrahim asks a good question. Ibrahim asks, when in liquidation, doesn't the company work in the best interest of creditors? And does this have an effect on leave being granted? Um, yes. Well, doesn't the company work? Well, well, let's break that down a bit. So, so when a company's in liquidation, it's the liquidator doing the hard work, the heavy lifting. Um, and then does this have an effect on leave being granted? Yes, is the short answer to that. Because if you might imagine the scenario, and Ibrahim, thanks for this excellent question. If you imagine the scenario where a liquidator has been appointed, they are going about their business of trying to discover what debts are owed to this company, call in as much money as they can, in order to eventually pay it out to creditors when the time comes, um, the liquidator will be exploring this stuff. Now, when it comes to um, does the liquidator's role going off and executing these functions have an impact on whether the court will exercise its discretion to grant leave for your contributory client, your shareholder client, to come and bring an application pursuant to the court's inherent jurisdiction, that was a long question, wasn't it? But the answer to it is yes. So it will have some bearing, but even more bearing than that will actually be the liquidator themselves expressing an opinion. And so the liquidator will sometimes, I withdraw that, the liquidator's attitude to an application is relevant to the court's exercise of its discretion. So the court will be interested to hear from the liquidator about why it's a good or bad idea or why the liquidator doesn't care in relation to the application. Hope that makes sense. Let me know if it doesn't and we can get back into it. So here we have another company that is in liquidation. 
we have a member who is granted leave to sue uh, at first instance and loses, right? That uh, shareholder, former shareholder, now says, right, I want to bring an appeal. It says two things. Either when you gave me leave to bring my first claim, you gave me leave to appeal, so I've already got leave. Or second, if that analysis is wrong and I don't have leave, then you should grant me leave now. Well, the court had to work through the nature of the leave granted. And, and ho hopefully you can understand the argument. Hey, you granted me leave to sue this person. I lost. Now I want to appeal. Well, when you first granted me leave, that included an appeal. Right? That makes sense? The court found no in relation to did the court previously grant leave to bring the appeal. And the reason for that, I hope we can all agree, is reasonably straightforward um, because quite literally an appeal is a different piece of litigation to a primary application. If you are appealing something, you are looking through the primary judgment to try to find your fine issues, fine points um, to bring up in an appellate context versus just redoing the same thing again. Um, so uh, the idea that the court would even have capacity to be able to say, yes, we grant you leave to bring the first instance application and if you lose, then you can bring an appeal. It's sort of alien to some of these analyses we've had today because if we put ourselves in the shoes of a court who might be hearing that application, if you and I come and say, we want leave to stand in the company's shoes to sue X, and if we lose against X, we also want leave to appeal, well, the court will say, well, what's the basis of the appeal? I can't, I can't discuss that with you. I can understand whether it's in the best interest of the company that you should be granted leave to appeal. I can understand if the, I can't understand if there's a serious question. I can't even understand if you're doing it in good faith. And so um, the court finds reasonably comfortably with great respect um, that the leave granted to the applicant at first instance did not include leave to bring a derivative appeal. And so the applicant then says, well, if I don't already have leave, then give me leave now. And that sort of makes sense. The court also says no. Now, the reason the court says no is comparable but different from um, some of the bases we were just describing. And those bases are uh, chiefly that the applicant did not put in front of the court evidence about how precisely the appeal would be run. So there wasn't a transcript of the primary judgment. There weren't detailed, potentially something like a senior counsel's advice saying, oh, hey, I've read the transcript and I think we can appeal on these bases. Um, the lack of evidence meant that the court was unable to form a view about whether there was any merit in the proceedings. And having been unable to form that view, the court considered it was not appropriate and indeed did not grant leave for the applicant to bring a derivative application. Relevantly as well, the applicant was more or less impecunious. And so the value of their indemnity that they offered was not especially high. Okay, we've got another case coming up in a sec. This case is called Global Advanced Metals. And it is about um, an applicant who's like a 13% shareholder in a company that operates a mine uh, that produces and supplies tantalum, this chemical. And very importantly for us, the value of tantalum varies wildly year in, year out. Um, we either should be doing buy, buy, buy tantalum or sell, sell, sell tantalum, depending on how we perceive the current scenario, because as I say, the value varies wildly and that's going to be relevant to the facts here. What the applicant says was, hey, board of directors, you approved sale of some tantalum for $60 million and that was an undervalue because you should have accepted somewhere in the range of 245 million to 915 million. Now that sale took place in 2016, that sale for 60 million. The valuation discrepancy referred to was based in substantial part by the fact that in 2018, a portion only, some of that $60 million worth of tantalum was sold for 1.15 billion. And so you can imagine the plaintiff saying, you know, scratch, 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 
All right, so the whole thing is worth 60 million in 2016, but only part of it is worth 1.15 billion in 2018. Two years for a you know, multiple, multiple, multiple return. And so this uh, doesn't form the foundation, but, but, but this sort of hindsight approach is kind of relevant to the applicant's analysis, saying how on earth can it have been okay for you? How on earth did you do your diligence? How on earth did you comply with your duties if you let billions of dollars or, you know, a billion, a billion and a bit dollars worth of stuff flow out the door for $60 million? Now, what, and so what the applicant's saying is a failure to investigate and, and all these sorts of things. Um, but what the court turns to is this hindsight problem I alluded to before. And the challenge the court has is, hey, look, the value at 2018 of tantalum doesn't actually say all that much about the value of tantalum in 2016. Your markets change, especially an extremely volatile market, apparent, like apparently tantalum must be. Um, the very high value in 2018 does not say a lot about the you know, possible value that it might have had in 2016. And there's not a lot the plaintiff can say about that because the court goes on to say, well, um, if we're doing this hindsight analysis, then why do we uh, rely on the very high value in 2018, the 1.15 billion, or say the exceeding 1.15 billion? And why do we not rely on, for example, the very low 2019 value? Because if we're doing hindsight from 2019, the analysis looks different again. And so the court raises this not to say, um, ha ha, that's the complete analysis, but raises it. And sorry, thank you all for joining. I, I see I see names come in and I try to wave and say hello. Um, thank you all for your time and space. And so the court says, well, um, this problem is a real one and it's one that needs to be confronted. And so the court then needs to work through the criteria pursuant to section 237. So is the company going to bring the claim? No. The short point, the directors weren't going to satisfy, sorry, weren't going to cause the company to sue themselves. And so the first section 237, subsection two element is satisfied. Was the applicant coming in good faith? Yes, it's a short point. Um, the applicant's a shareholder and they're saying, hey, the company's lost all this value. Um, <laughs> I want it back. <laughs> I want the company to come and claim that value back. And this is my genuine, you know, genuine belief that, that there's a real claim here. So tip. Good faith is satisfied. The failure arose in a combination of best interests and serious question. Now, do you remember I raised that hindsight problem when we were speaking a moment ago? That hindsight problem was one that was not solved on the evidence. And that hindsight problem was one that afflicted the query about whether there really is a serious issue to be tried in respect of the question. But the most fundamental point was about the best interests. The court found that it would not be in the best interests of the company for leave to be granted to the applicant to bring this application. And the reason that the court found that, or the reasons were, there were a number of them. In the background of these reasons is the claim did not necessarily have um, fabulous prospects, right? Sorry, I'm looking at the wrong computer now. I should be looking at this one or this one. I looked over at that one. So uh, we're doing well. Um, <laughs> so firstly, we've got a claim with not compelling prospects. Secondly, um, we've got the court looking through what's actually going to happen if um, there is leave being granted. Well, what the court finds is that there's going to be some disruption and distraction to the company because you're suing the whole board and the CEO, right? That's going to upset what's going on with the company. Um, the court finds that the insurance premiums for DNO insurance are going to increase, that there are going to be some deals that are put at risk um, in relation to this company, and that potential lenders might be scared off if this litigation is bubbling along. And so notwithstanding the apparent sort of, oh, I won't quite say obviousness, but with great respect, the superficial you know, query we might raise about an asset worth 60 million in 2016 and then more than 1.15 billion in 2018 and they're not being some goof there with the valuation. 
notwithstanding that sort of apparent query that, that I suspect is apparent to us all when we look at that on its face, um, the court finds it is not in the best interest of the company that that claim be brought and does not grant leave to the shareholder to proceed. Interesting stuff. I'm going to skip a couple of cases because we've only got 14 minutes left. While I do the skip, 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 what I'm skipping through is I'm skipping through my notes and uh, you're welcome to have a copy of them if you want to text me. Uh, sorry, if you want to, well, no, well, I guess you could text me if you've got my mobile. Uh, if you want to email me or DM me, very happy to send them through. Uh, this is the second in a series of five one-hour talks I'll be giving as part of a series of CLEs. I can drop the details for you. You should be able to find them. Uh, and if you can't, you can DM me as well. But I think the next one's just at 12.30. Next Thursday, Australian Eastern Standard Time. So we'd love to have your company then. Let us get to a decision called Tideman. Uh, and this decision I can hopefully dispose of reasonably quickly. Um, here, we have an applicant that is a parent and child. And the applicants are trying to get the new trustee of their super fund to sue this other company because they say, hey, this other company did, affected, this other company affected an improper share buyback. And so court, I want you to grant us leave to stand in the shoes of this other company to go and sue this other company who improperly bought back shares that ought to form part of the super fund. Now, they fail in the application just to give away the ending. They fail for a number of reasons. Um, one of them is that they are the sole directors and shareholders of the company they are seeking leave in respect of, right? So this example we keep coming to, you and me as shareholders in us, PTY Limited, and some weirdo director steals our money. No, no. In this case, uh, child and parent are the shareholders in this company, and it is them, PTY Limited, and they are also the directors. And so they are in complete control of the company, and so they are able to bring the application. And so the court says, well, no, this isn't brought in good faith at all. This is brought for some weird ulterior purpose. And it's in the context of 12 other pieces of litigation in relation to this same strange buyback being brought and in relation to, with great respect, what appears to be an attempt to get around an obligation that the company needs to instruct lawyers in order to go ahead. There are questions about abuse of process, but the short point is the applicants fail and they fail in one of the rare examples of failing to meet the good faith test because of this strange scenario where it, where it appears that the application is brought um, in, in, for an ulterior motive. Now, I know I'm rushing through and there are so many great cases. Maybe we'll just do one more. Uh, and then if you're desperate for more uh, exciting derivative action content, that hot derivative action content, um, yeah, hit me for the paper and that's fine. What I'd like to do now is spend a couple of minutes digging into the fundamental nature of what we're talking about to then bring you to this final case we're going to discuss called Gillespie Cranes. We've been talking about you and I are shareholders in a company. And we're talking about you and I being shareholders in a company where someone's taken some money away from the company and we want to get that money paid back in to the company, right? What about a trust is the short point. Well. Um, the challenge here is that the trust derivative action, to the best of my understanding, did not exist. Um, it turns out I was wrong, and I found out I was wrong in this judgment of Gillespie Crane's nominees. We're not going to dive into it too deeply, but our plaintiff today is the beneficiary of a trust. And the trust has pretty substantial assets in the tens of millions or possibly the hundreds of millions of dollars. And the plaintiffs, who are actually siblings of the applicant, cause the trust to dissipate its assets um, to other directions and to entities related to these misbehaving or allegedly misbehaving brothers. They're causing themselves and companies related, them to, related to them to benefit at the expense of the trust. They're distributing out all these trust assets. And so what our plaintiff sibling does is complain and seek leave in relation to these tens of millions of dollars. I, th I think one of the assets that dissipated is worth $58 million. Um, there's another company that has substantial value as well. They're all dissipated off to companies related to plaintiffs. 
Now, importantly, our plaintiff, sorry, not plaintiffs, companies related to the natural persons who are in control of the trustee, right? They're using their control of the trustee to funnel this money off to benefit themselves. And so this actually is not a claim of the plaintiff. This is not a beneficiary's claim. It's a claim of the trustee. It's a claim of the trust fund. These are trust funds, trust assets that are being dissipated. And in the past, we would have spoken about trying to get the trustee fired uh, and any number of other paths. And I would incorrectly have you know, not have said a derivative action was available. Now, this judgment corrects me in respect to that, where leave is indeed granted to the plaintiff beneficiary to stand in the shoes of the trustee and to bring an application to get this stuff back. Now, let's just step through that one more time to make sure we've got it straight in our heads. A company can be a trustee, and that's the case here. And a company is different to a trust. And a shareholder is different to, a shareholder of a company is different to the beneficiary of a trust. Here, the beneficiaries are saying, where's my distribution? There are complaints about absent distributions as well, I should say. <coughs> but here, the beneficiaries are granted leave to stand in the shoes of the trustee, essentially of the trust, to get this money paid back into the corpus of the trust, notwithstanding the fact it might not come back into their hands as beneficiaries. Normally, I say, I'm a beneficiary. There was a breach of trust. Uh, I lost X dollars as a result of this breach of trust. Here, the beneficiaries are unable to say, well, they're able to, but in relation to, let's take the $55 million example, they're unable to say they suffered any loss on account of that $55 million transfer. What they're able to say is the trust lost $55 million on account of that transfer. Is that clear as mud? That's the real magic of this case because the beneficiary in respect of the trust is able to do what we've been speaking about, the shareholder in respect of the company being able to do. And that's why Gillespie Cranes is a useful case to look at. And that was the end of the second section of this talk. Um, I had too much fun and I went for too long, but uh, look, I enjoyed it. I hope you did too. Let's just get to the third section of today's talk, some practical steps that I'm going to try to leave two or three minutes for questions, and then we'll get out of here spot on time mainly because we've skipped a lot of cases. So you can go back and read some of them in the notes if you'd like. Let me zoom out. I practice in shareholder litigation. Right? What happens if you're a lawyer, you're acting for a client who comes in and that client is the shareholder in the company and that client is unhappy with the way a company is going about its business. Right? For whatever reason, company is not going about it in the way the shareholder wants and the shareholder feels aggrieved. Well, last week we spoke about corporate oppression, which is when we consider that a shareholder, uh, that, that there is commercial unfairness in respect of a shareholder. Um, and if you didn't attend that, uh, I'm happy to send you the notes or you can go find the video that I, I did and it's uploaded on YouTube and Instagram. You're able to go and find that if you're interested. It's also on LinkedIn, I think. Um, and so we have this idea that with corporate oppression, you seek a share sale or a wind up. You seek an exit, right? If your shareholder company, so if your shareholder client gets a sale, they have money in their pocket and they're gone. They're not related to the company anymore. Or if they wind up the company, they're gone. They're not a part of running the company anymore. A liquidator has been appointed and they're waiting to hopefully get something back from the liquidation of the company. If we take the example of a derivative action, remember what your shareholder client is actually doing is standing in the shoes of the company to get money paid back to the company, right? They're not standing in the shoes of the company to get money paid, diverted away from the company and paid to themselves. They're trying to get the company's money back for the benefit of the company. And so the only reason your client would do that or should be advised to do that is if they want to stay a shareholder of the company, they want to stay a part of it because you don't want to benefit some, you don't want to spend money and accept risk in order to benefit some entity you don't care about. If you're going to spend the money, if you're going to accept the risk in relation to a derivative suit, what you want to do is you want to stay a part of that entity that you've you know, applied all this blood, sweat and tears to benefit it. 
And so if you're a lawyer who finds yourself in the position of an agreed shareholder coming in to say, oh, hey, us PTY Limited is being run in this really unfair way and it's really upsetting and it's, oh, isn't it so tough? You say, oh, yeah, look, that sounds pretty tough. Um, but <laughs> do you want to stay or do you want to go? And if the answer is, mm, I don't know, that's actually surprisingly rare in my experience. The answer might be, hey, it's a family company. It owns a thousand bits of real estate and it's really tax effective and you know, I want to stay in this thing. I just want to deal with this specific issue. Um, they sort of want to stay. Or perhaps a slightly more businessy context, um, you might say, hey, look, the relationship of trust is totally broken down. Hate this person, got to get them out of my life. Like I'm gone, I'm over, this is done. That's more likely to be a corporate oppression where you're going to pursue a share sale or a wind up. So my fundamental practical suggestion to you, um, if you're an aggrieved shareholder or if you're a person advising aggrieved shareholders, is to think carefully about whether your client wants to stay, in which case derivative actions are what I'd recommend, or whether your client wants to go, in which case I'd think carefully about corporate oppression. Plus, there's some other practical stuff that's in the paper. Okay, that's the end of the talk. Let me quickly recap it, then we'll have questions, then I'll get out of your face. We spoke about three sections today. We spoke about derivative suits, that problem of what if you're a shareholder in a company the company's not going to bring a claim that it has against someone else. Well, if the company is solvent and is not in liquidation, you're going to make an application pursuant to Section 237, 236 and 237 of the Corporations Act. And what you are going to try to do um, is you are going to do your best. Thank you for these very, very kind comments. Um, you are going to try to do your best um, to comply with those subsections of Section 237. You're going to say the company's not going to do it. I'm coming in good faith, best interests, serious question, notice. Or if the company's in liquidation, you're going to seek the liquidator's view. You're going to think about practical considerations and you are going to think about whether uh, the case is indeed a serious, a serious one that's worth pursuing. We then worked through a number of examples that I hope assisted you. And we then closed out on just what I really wanted to hit you between the eyes with. If you're thinking about corporate oppression versus derivative actions. And almost all of these discussions deal with, I'll draw that, almost all of these pieces of litigation deal with an election having to be made, right, by our litigant. What are we going to do? Are we going to stay? Are we going to go? And the answer to that question, I say, ought to guide you in relation to your choice of uh, relief that you want to pursue. Now, I hope that brought you value. Um, I've got the paper here if you would like it. Uh, you know, uh, do like, subscribe, subscribe, follow. I um, really, really appreciate the support on TikTok and the podcast and on Instagram and on LinkedIn and YouTube and Facebook. Um, 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 love, 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 love. If you want to copy of the paper, message me. Um, please, please come along to the next one. Please tell your friends and spread the word and all that sort of good stuff. And I'm not planning to say anything else from now. So um, with that, I might end the live over here on Instagram. Let's see how that works. Dun, 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 dun. I'm not doing a particularly good job of that. Are you sure you want to end your live video? Yes, thank you, Instagram. Uh, and let me head over to YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn. Uh, I'm going to end this broadcast too. Uh, so uh, thank you for your company. Thank you for all these comments that I have not read most of uh, and that I will get back to. And I will look forward to having your company again, hopefully next week. Many, many thanks to you.